let's, let's open in our, our Bibles, if you would. We're going to begin with the 10th verse of 1 Corinthians, the first chapter. 1 Corinthians 1.10. It will be our text this morning. And we're going to be talking about the subject of unity and the subject of division, which uh, you got to have one or the other, right? And uh, oftentimes, you know, our, our, the division, when, when we divide in the body of Christ, that division is oftentimes doctrinal. Now, there, there are, when we are contending for uh, an, an essential of the, of the faith, that's not divi division, okay? We're not dividing over that because the person that has uh, thrown off the essential of the faith, they've already done the dividing. But whenever we divide within the body of Christ over the non-essentials, uh, uh, and we, we say that the, uh, we make that a doctrinal issue, I think that's uh, uh, unfortunate. Uh, and we can, we can argue over what could be the correct interpretation of the Bible. For example, this English professor uh, had just walked into the classroom uh, one day and, and just wrote on the words, just uh, wrote on the blackboard these words with no pronunciation or uh, 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 punctuation or, uh, or anything, just all in capital letters. And it says uh, th these words, these six letters or six words, woman without her man is nothing. And then she asked, uh, or he asked the students to punctuate it. Well, all the guys in the classroom came up and uh, they said, woman, comma, without her man, comma, is nothing. That's the way all the guys interpreted it. And then, so then he said, well, how about the rest of you? And so all the girls stood up and they went up to the board and they immediately erased those two commas and, and they put a woman with, whoops, there it is. Woman, without her, man is nothing. And, and, and so the, the same words come with two entirely different interpretations, and, and the division would go up, uh, be divided. The division would come along somebody's particular bias. And we see that happen a lot in the body of Christ. But then other times I think our division is, is rather personal. The minister was opening his mail one morning and he pulled out a single sheet of paper from an envelope and uh, on it he found the single word fool. And, and um, the next Sunday he announced, he said, you know, I've had uh, received many letters over the years from people who have written things but then forgot to sign their name, but this is the first time I've seen somebody sign it and they forgot to put in the letter. And, and usually when, when things are personal, when we get into division over something that's personal, we end up making it doctrinal because that's easier to divide over. And so we'll somehow turn it into something uh, that's, that's doctrinal just to make it go down easier, I think. And so he begins, uh, after his introductory comments last week, he starts with verse 10 of chapter 1. Now I plead with you, brethren... By the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. The word divisions here in the original Greek is the word schismata. It's the plural of the word schism. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, you see that uh, our, we have that English word uh, that comes, derives from it. And what it means is to rend or to split or to sever. Um, pretty strong word. And, you know, if you're familiar with the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, this church had a lot of issues. I mean, they had incest. They were getting drunk at the Lord's table. Um, there was, uh, um, they had a lot of issues. I mean, there's hardly a chapter that goes by that Paul doesn't have to rebuke them over something that was going on there in the church. And yet division taking place within the church is at the very top of the list. The very first thing that he wanted to deal with. Of all the problems that existed there in the church, the top of the list is division. 
And, and he says that uh, you should be, uh, that you would be uh, perfectly joined together. And, and that's, it's actually just one word in the original language. And it's, it's the word that means to, it means to mend that which has been damaged or that which was broken. Uh, it would be used uh, of setting a broken bone. That would be the word if, if a doctor would go and, uh, you know, you broke a bone and then the doctor would come and set it. Uh, that would be the word that would be used for that. It's the same word for those of you that were here a few weeks ago when we closed out the book of uh, 1 Corinthians or for, uh, Galatians in chapter 6. It's the same word that says, brethren, uh, this is chapter 6, verse 1, if anyone is overtaken in a trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourselves lest you also be tempted. And that word restore there is the same word that is used here um, for uh, perfectly joined together. And as we saw then, that, that when you're setting a broken bone, sometimes uh, the, 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 the art of healing is as painful as, as the, 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 the setting the broken bone is just as painful as the broken bone itself. For it has been declared, and he's going to go into explain what, what uh, he's talking about here. He says, for it has been declared... To me, concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now, if you notice, uh, it says Chloe's household, and most of the English translations will render it that way. Uh, it's just the, it's uh, literally of Chloe is what it says in, in uh, the, the actual language. And uh, it's probably referring to her household. It's, it's just the people of Chloe, uh, regardless of what their relationship to her might have been. Uh, and it would appear as though there were these divisions that had been, had come. She had even allowed her name to be attached to the people that were coming and sharing this with them. She wanted uh, to make known that she was not any party uh, of, of that division. And, and uh, he says that it's, it's become known to me by, the, by those that are from Chloe that there are contentions among you. You know, also going back to Galatians chapter 5 that we looked at a few weeks back, it says if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. You know, I think many of us and commendably so. But if we, if we were, would go through the book of Corinthians and we'd see some of the other sin, I mean, drunkenness and, and, and sexual sin and that sort of stuff, we'd, we'd go through the book and we would see those sins being mentioned and we, we would abhor them. We would, we would uh, very uh, vociferously and vocally stand against that sort of thing while at the same time we bite and devour each other. Uh, Oftentimes in the name of some sort of doctrinal purity or, or uh, whatever we might put on it. And so he says at the very, at the very beginning of his list of, of problems, he says, let me address this one first. Now this I say that each of you, this is verse 12, that each of you says, I am of Paul or I am of Apollos or I am of Cephas or I am of Christ. Um, you know, we, first of all, he says, some of you say that I am of Paul. You know, Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. And so uh, there, there were those within the church there in Corinth, primarily a Gentile church, although it was a cosmopolitan area. There were a lot of Jews uh, in uh, Corinth as well. But uh, those that are of the Gentile persuasion, uh, they were the ones that says, we're down with Paul because he was the original apostle to the Gentiles. And so we are of the apostle Paul. And, and um, now, uh, these descriptions that I'm going to be giving of these four different factions uh, may or may not be what Paul had in mind when he was listing them. He doesn't go into any uh, definition or further description of them other than listing. Some say I'm of Paul, some say I'm of Apollo, some say Cephas, some say Christ. Uh, but let me, just, let me just give an examples of what Paul could be talking about here. And, you know, the first one is... 
I am of Paul. He was, the, he, he, was, he was the founder. He was the guy that went to Corinth, preached the gospel, and people got saved. And so uh, I, I remember the good old days. You know, I am all about the Apostle Paul is what some of them are saying. I don't care about all these Johnny Come Latelys because there is nobody like the Apostle Paul. Uh, and, you know, he was the apostle to the Gentiles. Now, Apollos, we read about him in the, in the book of Acts, and uh, he was a very gifted man. He was a great orator. He had this tremendous skill of, of oratory. Uh, he, he, he had a way of taking the language and putting the words together. He was a wordsmith, and he could stir a person's soul just by the way he would pronounce words. And he was, he was a, a very effective communicator because of that. And so uh, we could just say that, that uh, Apollos, you know, he, he was kind of, uh, people liked him because he was highly educated and, and he was sophisticated. And, and so he was kind of like, uh, you know, very big with the educated suburbanites uh, of, of Corinth. And so he, the, he was the first church of the updite, uptight erudites, you know, we could say. Um, he was a Hellenized Jew from Alexandria which was the second largest city in the Roman Empire, and uh, over a quarter of the, of the population of Alexandria was Jewish. It was the highest concentration of, of Jews outside of Jerusalem in any metropolitan area. And, uh, and so there, was, there were those within the Corinthian church that loved Apollos, because it's a Greek name. Corinth was a Greek city, and they liked that connection. And then there's Cephas. He says, some say I'm of, uh, of uh, Cephas. And, and uh, you know, Cephas is, the, uh, it's an Aramaic name, which was the name that would have been spoken by the Jews. Hebrew was kind of, uh, uh, effectively kind of uh, a lost language by the first century. It was only spoken, it was a r rabbinical language. That was the only place you ever saw it spoken of was kind of, kind of how Latin is with the Catholic Church. Uh, th that's how Hebrew was with the, with the Judaism in the first century. And the uh, rank and file Jews spoke Aramaic. That's the language they brought back from Babylon after captivity. And Cephas was an Aramaic name. And it means rock. The name Cephas means rock. And, and uh, you know, remember when Jesus says uh, uh, Simon was his given name, and he says, you are, uh, you, your name is Simon, but I, I'm going to call you rock. You, you, are, you are Peter. And that's the Greek name. That's the Greek form of that. But here, and it's interesting that when Paul was writing to, the only other time he mentions Peter outside of, uh, in, in, the only time it's mentioned in Paul's writings is in the book of Galatians. And throughout the book of Galatians, he's called by his Greek name, Peter. But here he gives his Aramaic name to show the divisions that were taking place in the church. He gives his Aramaic name, Cephas. And some people were saying, I am of, of Cephas. And so here, here this, this would be the, the traditionalists, you know, the, the, very, the Sabbath keepers, the, the ones that, uh, you know, the, after all, we were the first Christians, the Jews would say. And, and the, the, the Greeks, the Gentiles, they were the ones that came in. They were afterthoughts because salvation came first to the Jews. And, and, and Peter was the apostle to the Jews. And so... Uh, uh, they say, I am a Cephas. And then lastly, they say, there are those that say, I am of Christ. Now, we, we could think that after these three sectarian kind of divisions of Peter and Apollo, or Paul and Apollos and, and Cephas, that then finally there would be some group in there that got it right, say, well, I'm of Christ. But I don't think that's what Paul's not saying that here. He's, he's, even those that were saying that I am of Christ, they were being sectarian uh, as well. And, and it was, a, you know, they, these were the Bible-thumping fundamentalists. You know, they, this would be the Church of Christ. And they, they were, we, 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 we have his name uh, on our church. And, and we need to understand that there's nothing wrong with any of these four groups, per se. There's room within the body of Christ for all four of them. There's room for the Gentiles. There's room for the sophisticated and educated. There's room for the traditionalist. And there's room for the Bible thumpers. You know, there's room for all of us within the body of Christ. 
Nothing wrong with any of their groups. In fact, their strength, what Paul should have been saying is, what I love it about Corinth is you got these different groups and, and within the church, and it wasn't a large church, but within the church there in Corinth, you've got these four different flavors and it's, it's so beautiful how they all kind of homogenize together in unity. What strength that that would have brought them if they had done that. And what should have been their strength was their greatest weakness. Uh, Spurgeon kind of addressed this. Remember, he wrote like a long time ago. And a and, and long time ago over in Britain. So it just makes it even harder to understand. Uh, but he, but, he, but he, used, he used language that would have been uh, uh, contemporary to his day. And, and he, has, he, he said this about, in his commentary on this passage, he said, I bless God that there are so many denominations. If there were not men who differed a little in their creeds, we should never get as much gospel as we do. God has sent different men to defend different kinds of truth, but Christ defended and preached all. Christ's testimony was perfect. Now, now, <clears throat> Spurgeon is not saying that all truth is Christ's truth or anything like that. You know, he's not just saying that, uh, uh, he's, he's not talking about all roads lead to Christ. Uh, it's not that. He's just saying that within, within the, the body of Christ, there are variegations of people because God made people variegated. And, and so uh, he has allowed denominations to rise up to minister to people who are more traditional People who are maybe of, of uh, uh, you know, the, the, like Paul was to the Gentile uh, people or as, as uh, 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 Apollos was to the more uh, educated and sophisticated or as Cephas was to the more uh, traditionals, uh, tra traditional believers or uh, as the, the fundamentalists, the, 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 the King, King James only crowd, if you will, uh, there's room for all of those within the body of Christ. And it, what should have been their strength, the sign of strength should have been, uh, turned out to be their demonstration of weakness. Is Christ divided? He asked in verse 13, was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? You know, he says, think about it. There, how many bodies of Christ are there? Well, there's only one. And he says, okay, so is that body of Christ divided? I mean, you know, if, when, the, when the body of Christ, I remember years ago as a young believer, and I was talking to a relative who was from a um, kind of a, a, a more contentious type uh, uh, side of uh, the Christian church uh, that wanted to, you know, split hairs over minor things, and I was a young believer and, and was easily uh, drawn into debate, if you will. And we'd gone around for some time over it, and, and um, I thought I was doing a pretty good job of making my case. Um, when, when she said, she said to me, she said, do you think the body of Christ will ever be united? And, and like I said, I was a young believer, so I wasn't even sure if, if what I was about to say was true because I had to stop and think about it for a second. And, and, and I thought, no, I, yeah, I think this sounds right. I, said, uh, we are, I, I replied to her, I said, we're already united. We just don't act like it. You know, I mean, we, we are the, the body of Christ is not divided. We just act like we are. Um, and, you know, when, when, when the body of Christ is divided, who bleeds? Right? There's a, there's a story from the closing chapters of Judges. Some of you may be familiar with it. Uh, about a guy who had a concubine and some... Uh, guys from the tribe of Benjamin came and, and uh, took her. They kind of kidnapped her and, and they, uh, they, they took her and did what they wanted to with her. They abused her throughout the night and um, all of them had their way with her and, 
and with her, then they released her, and with her, her dying effort, she crawled back up onto the front porch of uh, um, her master's uh, house, and there she died. And he looked, got up the next morning and opened the door, and there she was, and he, he realized what had happened. Now, if you're not familiar with the story, this next part's going to be kind of weird. So he, he, he chopped her up into 12 different pieces. And then he boxed her up, called FedEx, and, and had, had a piece sent to each one of the 12 tribes. I mean, I, you know, this, this is just what happened. You know, the Bible is just very accurate in recording, recording what happened. But when, when and, and so, you know, the, the tribe of Judah, you know, their boss people opened up the box and they saw the right hand and the box, of, the leader of Simeon, they opened up a box and they saw the left hand. And, and as, as it went around to each one of the different tribes and they opened it up and they saw a different body part and, and they were like appalled. This could happen. In the nation of Israel, this, this, could, this could happen among the tribes of Judah, I mean, uh, uh, the tribes of Israel, and it became a rallying cry for them for unity. And, and, and yet, the thing that, that the, the enemy went, meant for division became that which was intended for unity. And the thing that the Lord means for unity becomes the thing that the enemy uses for division. And it, we're, we're appalled at the story from Judges, and, and yet that story turns out better than the story that we're living in our contemporary age, at least the way it is now. He says, I thank God that I baptized none of you except for Crispus and Gaius, lest anyone should say that I had baptized in my own name. Yet I also baptized the household of Stephanus. He said, yeah, okay, I remember that. Besides, I do not know whether I baptized any others. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. He says, I thank God that, God has, that he didn't send me to baptize. Romans chapter 6 teaches us that baptism uh, is a picture of us being united with Christ, being joined together with him in his death, burial, and resurrection. Right? Uh, Romans 6 gives a good picture of that. Uh, and, and, and yet, just think of how divided the church is over the subject. I mean, how many, boy, how many different ways can you slice and dice the subject of baptism? You know, first of all, who qualifies to be the dunker? You know, how educated does the person have to be to be the dunker? Do, do they have to be of a certain office within the church? Do they have to be of a certain gender within the church? Who is the qualifier to be the person that uh, takes the donkey out into the water? And then do they dunk or do they pour or do they sprinkle or do they super soaker or what, you know, what, what, what is or... Do they do it as an adult? Do they do it as a baby? Do they do it to join a particular denomination? And if you get baptized under another denomination, then you have to get rebaptized before you can join this denomination. And all the different ways we have sliced and diced the subject of baptism. I mean, it's, it's sad that the greatest picture of unity that we have, the, the, the picture that we have of unity in the Bible, that of baptism, unity with Christ, and it's become uh, one of the greatest demonstrations of our divisions. Now, if, if we don't divide over all those different nuances, that's, that's fine. That's fine, but I've, I've been told on more than one occasion about people that have... Uh, uh, become Christians and got baptized and then for whatever reason they were going to a different denomination or a different church within the denomination in some cases and that the church leadership required them to get baptized again. And it's, it's sad that we got this, this great picture of our unity and, and yet it becomes one of the greatest demonstrations of, of the things that we can divide over. 
And, and so Paul, I, I guess Paul didn't know any better because he said, I thank God that I didn't baptize any. Well, okay, there was, yeah, those two. Oh, yeah, one, yeah, three. I remember, the, and yeah, there's a few, handful. I don't know how many thousands of people uh, Paul led to the Lord, but he can count on one hand the people that he baptized. You know, when we, and then there's the subject of what's called baptismal regeneration. And, uh, and this is based primarily, it's not solely, but primarily based upon what uh, the verse from uh, Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, where he says in verse 38 of that chapter, he says, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And then he says, for the remission of sins, and, and then you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Um, and I, I, was, I was raised in a denomination that said that this says very clearly that you've got to, once you, once you repent, then, and, and, and you, you hear the gospel and you repent and then you believe in the gospel, you believe, you place your faith in Jesus Christ, then you've got to get baptized because it says you got to, in order for your sins to be washed away because it says be baptized uh, in the name of Jesus Christ for for the remission of your sins. It says it there very clearly. It's not black and white. It's, 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 well, it's, okay, it's black and white. Uh, be baptized for the remission of your sins. The problem is that the word for can have two definitions. It can mean with a view towards. In other words, you can be baptized with a view towards remission of your sins. Or you can be baptized because of. Uh, you can be baptized because of the remission of your sins. Uh, you know, like you need to reach for the brass ring. That would be with a view towards. Or because of, uh, he jumped for joy. S same word in both sentences, but they have two different definitions, right? Three-letter word. How can we tell which one it is? Well, the context would tell us. And so, here we're looking at Acts 2.38. Be baptized for the remission. Is this a baptized with a view toward the remission of sins or a baptized because of the remission of sins? I've used this illustration many times before, but I feel as a, as a public service, I need to repeat it because we have a lot of people that don't know that you haven't yet, you've started coming to church since I used the illustration two weeks ago. Uh, but... Uh, I, I, I said, this is a, a, a public service warning. I want to warn you all about this particular dude named Josiah. You've probably seen him. I mean, I mean you, you can see that he's such a desperado that the booking officer had a really hard time getting him to remove his mask before uh, he had his uh, uh, mugshot taken. And uh, please be warned, for those of you that, that have, have seen Josiah running around the church. I'm, I'm, don't, don't, I'm serious. There, 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 there is no electronics, especially oscillating fans in your office, that are safe when Josiah is around, okay? Uh, I mean, he is armed with a screwdriver and a 20-piece security Allen set wrench. I mean, he can take it apart, okay? And he will. He will. None of those are safe in his presence. Now, Josiah is wanted. He is wanted for dissembling of small electronics. Now, this is a wanted picture. And so, when we, when we see this wanted picture, he is so... He wouldn't even... He, he, he insisted on smiling for his, for his wanted poster. You know, I mean... He, he, he just, he, he, he's incorrigible. Uh, but he's wanted for dissembling small electronics. Now, is this a solicitation to fix your toaster? You know, we are looking, we want, Josiah is wanted so that he can fix your toaster. I mean, is, is that what this, is that what we're saying here? With the, or is this saying that uh, your toaster is now in a million pieces and it's strewn all over the house and Jojo is the chief suspect and we're gunning for him, you know? Uh, well, the context of the wanted poster tells us, right? And, and so when we go back to the day of Pentecost... And Paul just, he, he, or Peter lays out 
the gospel about how Jesus died for the sins of the world, that all who place their faith in him can have everlasting life. And, 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 and then he's, he, he says, so let all of you who have heard the gospel and repent do so because your sins have been remitted. He did, there, there's, there, there, uh, I mean, for one thing, there were 3,000 people added to the church that day. I don't think that there were three, they had time to baptize 3,000 people all at the same time, you know. Uh, I mean, it's not like it was Corona Del Mar, you know, at, at, in Pirate's Cove. I mean, you know, that's a lot of people to get baptized. They, they, uh, and and they didn't have that much water there to be able to get them all out in the, in the cove at the same time. Um, and so I, I don't think, you know, we're not, uh, baptismal regeneration is the idea that once you believe, then you've got to be baptized before you can be saved. And, and the, the church that I was brought up in, that not only do you had to be baptized to be saved, but you had to be baptized for the remission of your sins. In other words, the reason why you get baptized is so that you can be saved. And if that's not the reason you get baptized, you would go in a dry center and come out a wet center. That's the way I was taught growing up. What about the thief on the cross? You know, Luke uh, 23, 43, Jesus says to him, Assuredly, I say to you that if they would let you get down off the cross real quick so you could get dunked, today you'll be with me in paradise. No, that's not what it says, is it? He says, today, because this guy said, I, I believe that you are the Son of God. And Jesus said, today you're going to be with me in paradise. And th this is what I was told when I asked my church leaders that question. They said, well, that was, he was under the old covenant. Because Jesus hadn't died for their sins yet, and so the new covenant hadn't been established yet. So he was still living under the old economy. And, and so that's why he didn't have to get baptized in order to be saved. Okay. So, under the dispensation of law, people get saved by grace. But under the dispensation of grace, we get saved by something that we go and do. Got it. Okay. Now, now it's all clear. Uh, <laughs> You know, I, 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 let's move on. I'm going to, before I dig my hole any further. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Um. You know, the message of the cross is foolishness. That's what it just says to those who are perishing. Our, our problem with understanding this verse is that we have so sanitized the cross in our present culture. You know, we've we made jewelry out of it. We have gold embossed crosses on our leather-bound Bibles. We have uh, T-shirts and all kinds of clothing. Um, uh, it's we, we've kind of sanitized it you know and you've probably heard the illustration about you know it's the equivalent of the, the, the you could say the, the message of the uh, electric chair is foolishness so, something that has been kind of in, in the news a lot in, in recent years is because you know there's uh, many states have abolished the death penalty and those that have have not uh, that still have the death penalty. Ever so often, there'll be an execution, and and we have we have tried to make execution down to a fine science. We've tried to to boil it down to a fine art. Uh, so the the idea is how how can we we uh, execute somebody who's guilty of a capital crime? How can we uh, execute the, them in the quickest and most painless way possible? Because the other ways of doing so were so barbaric. You know, hanging. Um, shooting, uh, 
electric chair, a gas chamber, you know, we, and so we, we tried all, all different ways to kind of, and, and there's always, you know, there'll be some, some type of, no matter how sophisticated we've gotten it, there's some execution that where things go awry, and instead of just taking uh, a few seconds for the person to have a painless passing uh, from this life, uh, there'll be several minutes of agony, and, and so then that brings up the whole subject of capital punishment all over again. You know, we've probably been familiar with, with some of the debate over that. Not so in the first century. They did not have that debate in the first century. That was not a thing. You know, they did, they did, they did, what they, the idea of executing people was not to make it painless. Uh, the, the Romans uh, actually, adot, the, the, it was the Babylonians that invented crucifixion. The Romans perfected it. And, and they had brought it down to a fine art. I mean, they, they, they weren't trying to see how quickly and painlessly they could execute somebody. They wanted to see how slowly and painfully they could execute somebody. Because they wanted it to be a, 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 a signal to everybody that you don't want to be executed. You don't want to be guilty of, of a capital crime under the Roman government. And, and so that, that was that when you mentioned the cross to somebody in the first century, especially to a Christian in the first century, uh, it had a whole other meaning. When you said the message of the cross then, that, the, the message of the cross, it would, be to, it would be the same thing as saying the message of the slow and excruciatingly painful and publicly humiliating death is foolishness. Because that's exactly what would have been evoked in somebody's mind in the first century when you said the word cross. And, you know, here's the thing about the message of the cross. It's, it's, it's foolishness to those that are perishing, Paul says. You know, for, for somebody that, that they, they don't want to embrace Jesus, they, they don't want to surrender to him, they don't want to make him Lord, then the idea of... of you know, they, they want to call their own shots. They want to be the master of their own fate and the captain of their own destiny. They want to, they, they want to uh, be their own Lord. I know I was, I was them, you know, and I remember. And the idea of somebody taking our place for a judgment is, is foolish. I don't need anybody to take my place. I'll take my own judgment. It's foolishness to them. But, you know, I think that, that you know, here, the, the, the message of the cross is imperative. It's not just simply a, a part of the gospel. It's a, it's a, it's a, 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 a very crucial and, and irreversible aspect of the gospel. It begins and ends at the cross. You know, some people... Uh, I, you, I, I've said quite often that you can't go to the cross and not be changed. You know, and, and I mean, th 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 that's true. For, for Christians, you know, you're struggling with something or you're, or you're you know, wanting to rejuvenate, or rejuvenize your, your spiritual life or something like that. I, I, I say for all believers, just go to the cross. Just come to the cross. See the love that was poured out there. See, see what Jesus did. And maybe it's, you know, you don't, I'm not talking about a crucifix. I'm talking about coming, just coming to the cross and seeing what was done there. You can't, you can't walk away. You, you'll be changed by that. But I think the same thing is true for those that say that the message of the cross is foolishness because if, if, if somebody does not want to have their life changed by the cross, if they don't want to surrender to the life, the lordship of Jesus, you, you go to the cross, that, that person goes to the cross, and your life will be changed too. Not for the better. You, you won't be drawn toward him, but your life will become hardened. Your heart will become hardened against what Jesus did, the love that was demonstrated there. And, and so what, uh, what he's saying here is that the message, of the, the, very, the very thing that is the focal point of our faith is, is foolishness to those who are not of it. And remember, Corinth was this, I mean, this is the, the, the center of Greek culture and, and they had their philosophers and, and it was all about, they would sit around and debate Plato and... Socrates and all that sort of stuff and, and 
Uh, they love to philosophize over the minutest details of life. And he says in verse 20, where's the wise? Where's the scribe? You know, the scribe would be the educated guy. Where's the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? You know, has their, their, their wisdom, their knowledge, their debates led them to a relationship with their creator? What, what good has any of that done as far as the true meaning of life? That, that's what, what Paul is asking here in verse 20. For since in the wisdom of God, so I'm not talking about the wisdom of this age, but the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message Preach to save those who believe. For the Jews request a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we cre preach Christ crucified. To the Jews a stumbling block, and to the Greeks foolishness. To those who are called, both Gr Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God, and the wisdom of God. S to the Jews he's a stumbling block. To the Gentiles, he's foolishness. Or if we could just maybe uh, stylize that a little bit, to the religious, he's a stumbling block. You know, you say to the religious person, you say to the person that goes to church every week, and they do all of their good stuff, and they do their, their they have the religious lingo, and they, uh, they, they, you know, have certain prayers that they say, and they, they go through all of that stuff, and you try to tell them that that's not enough? You, you, t you try to tell them that that doesn't accomplish a thing with regards to eternity? That's, that's, that's a stumbling block to them. They're stumbled by that. Whereas uh, to, to, to the non-believer, to the secularist, like the Greeks, he's foolishness. They think, that's silly. You, you know, why, why would you want to pray to a dead guy? You know, would be their thinking. Because he ain't dead, that's why, you know. I mean, uh, because he, he, he defeated death. And if we, we think about it, you know, it says, uh, th just think of these two words. We preach Christ crucified. Now think of those two words, Christ crucified. I, I'd be hard-pressed to find a more, two more oxymoronic words. You know, and you, you understand uh, oxymorons, you know, it's just uh, um, military intelligence. You know, that's one that people <laughs> throw out. NIV study Bible. That's one I made up on my own. Uh, I, I, I used to say country music, but that got me in a lot of trouble because I, I mean, we are in Oklahoma. Uh, but, but, but you understand what an oxymoron is, right? It, it two words, you put them alongside, and they mean the opposite. They, they, they're not compatible. Um, Christ crucified. That's, that's pretty oxymoronic. The perfect man died the ultimate death. I mean, how is that even possible, you know? Uh, and, and, you know, if, if you understand that, if you understand that the perfect man, the, the man who, who did not deserve death, the wages of sin is death, but Jesus didn't sin, yet he died, and, and so you understand that because he died a substitutionary death. He died for me. Then, you know, if you understand that, if, we, if you understand that Christ died for the sins of the world and that he rose again on the third day, then it becomes not a matter of, it, it, it's, it, it, it's not a matter of truth or false because it's true, you see. And, and so then it's a matter of truth or error. You know, it's a matter of truth that you, you embrace it or it's a matter of error because you reject it. Uh, and, and, you know, again, you can't go to the cross without being changed. It's just depending which way you want to be changed. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, verse 25, and the weakness is God, of God is stronger than men. So you take the very, I mean, the foolishness of God is wiser than man. You take all of man's wisdom, 
all a man's knowledge and then compare that alongside an all-wise, all-knowing God. They don't, uh, no comparison. Or, or, or you take uh, the strength of men versus the weakness, you know, the, 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 the the, the, strong, the strongest, the strength of men is, is the weakness. The weakness of God is stronger than the strongest strength of men. I mean, you know, you, you, a generation ago, two generations ago, you, you'd say, boy, man's got some strength now. I mean, we can blow the earth up. That, that, that's how much power man's got. <laughs> we, we can destroy all humanity. That ain't nothing anymore. I mean, gosh, we, we've got, we got so much strength, we can blow the earth up several times over, you know. We can blow up half the solar system with our strength. That's how strong we are. And, and, and yet, it, it, God in his weakness is stronger than man's greatest strength. There, there, for you see your calling, brethren, not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble were called. You, maybe you've heard this illustration before. It's oftentimes used on this passage, and, and it's, a, it's a good one. There was a gal that was, um, she, she was a, um, a, a countess back during uh, the Reformation period in England under John Wesley and, and uh, you know, the John, uh, th th those guys... Uh, she was, she was a strong Wesleyan, part of the Wesleyan movement. Her name was Serena uh, Hastings. And she used her wealth and position to help further Methodism in, um, in uh, England and, and beyond. And she used to say that she was saved by an M. She, that was one of her favorite lines, I was saved by an M. And when people asked her what she meant by that, she would quote this verse. She says, not many, it doesn't say not any mighty, uh, but not many or mighty, uh, uh, not many noble. It doesn't say not any noble, but not many noble. And so she would say, if it said not any, she would have been out of luck because she was of nobility. Uh, and the word noble here is the word uh, eugenes, which means well-born. You know, the first part of it, you means good, and then our, our word genetics comes from the second part of it. Uh, and uh, it says, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, uh, which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. Uh, where the word noble is the word eugenes, the word base things here in verse 28 is the word agenes, not born. It's, uh, there's a play on words in this. And he says, so there's not many noble, but God has chosen the, 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 very, the, the, the opposite of noble. Not, not, not somebody of humble origins, but somebody that's not even born. You know, he's, he's, he's trying to uh, draw as great a contrast to, as that as he could. You know, when, when I was a, a young believer, I tried to impress people with my uh, theological prowess. I didn't have any, <laughs> but I tried to impress people with it anyway, you know. I mean, uh, I tried to go to seminary, but it, it, it was hard. I mean, I flunked out after two years of high school. And, and I, I just, I, you know, <laughs> I, I, I did, I mean, I, I, I don't, I, seriously, I did finish high school, uh, but my only higher education I had was a year of drafting college uh, uh, right after high school. And, and that's the only formal education that, uh, that I've got. But that didn't stop me from trying to impress people with my theological acumen. And, and so I could talk a, a long time about stuff I had no idea what I was talking about. And, and uh, I don't know how many eyes I rolled uh, back in those days or not, but, but I, 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 you know, I'm just saying that to say that the only thing that's more pitiable uh, than a person with theological, uh, theological degree trying to impress people with their theological, de theological degree is somebody without a theological degree trying to impress people with his lack of theological understanding. And, and uh, because what Paul is saying is none of that accounts to anything when it comes to God. And he, he says, so that no flesh, verse 29, 
that no flesh, the educated and the non-educated, the highborn and the unborn, <laughs> that, the, 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 that no flesh should glory in his presence. Winston Churchill, and not somebody that you would normally quote on a Sunday morning, right? I mean, not usually some, somebody that would be quotable for a, a, a Bible context, uh, but Winston Churchill said this. He said, certain it is that while men are getting, gathering knowledge and power with ever increasing speed, their virtues and their wisdom have not shown any notable improvement as the centuries have rolled. Under sufficient stress, starvation, terror, warlike passion, or even cold, intellectual frenzy, the modern man we know so well will do the most terrible deeds, and his modern woman will back him up. Isn't that true? I mean, what good has all of man's wisdom done him down through the decades and centuries and millennia? How, how, how closer to being civilized have we actually become? But of him you are in Christ, this is verse 30, but of him you are in Christ who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. I, I, I understand that's kind of a difficult verse. I mean, it's, it's the, the language the, is kind of odd. It's, 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 it's hard to even uh, form accurately in, in the English. Uh, but of him... You are in Christ, who became for us wisdom from God. If I could paraphrase it, if I could just put it into the Mary Hugh Standard version, uh, it would uh, go something like this. God himself, and you can just kind of compare this to the passage. I'll leave this up for a minute if, if you'd like. But God himself is the source of our identity in Christ. For God chose his son to reveal the sum total of all wisdom. That, it, that is by faith we have our right standing or, or, I'm sorry, that, that is, and I wrote this and I can't read it. That is by faith we have our right to stand before him. That he will continue the work of conforming us into his image because he completely paid for our penalty for sin. I think any attempt for us to gain wisdom outside of Jesus and what he did at the cross is at the very least empty and vain. But at its worst, it's possibly eternally deceptive. Um, as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. He kind of, he does a, as he closes out the chapter here, he kind of does a, a nod toward Jeremiah chapter 9. I just, I'll close with this passage. He does kind of a little paraphrase of it. Uh, but here's, here's what the, the whole, it's a couple of verses from Jeremiah 9 that he summarizes into this one sentence. Uh, but here it is, Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24. Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. Nor let the rich man glory glory in his riches. But let him who glories, glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these I delight, says the Lord. Isn't that the truth? And that, that's the sum total of all wisdom is what God did through Jesus Christ at the cross. Uh, so God, we just thank you for that. We give you praise and glory. Uh, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the selflessness that he exhibited when he expended himself through the most uh, unfathomable, excruciating death. Uh, that even what he underwent at the hand of the Romans is nothing compared to what, is, uh, what, what we're deserving of and, and yet is not anything compared to what he did at your hand when you judged us in him that he took our place and paid for our sins our judgment for our rebellion so God we thank you for that we thank you for the cross we thank you for the example that we have and for the knowledge that uh, that's true wisdom to embrace what he did. 
not only for salvation, but for sanctification and for redemption. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.